I figured out what every single fire type Pokemon would want to eat and put it into a spreadsheet to compare their diets to real animals. This paper was recently published in Global Ecology and Biogeography and suggests that having a high body temperature was important for tetrapods, so amphibians, reptile, birds, and mammals, in evolving an herbivorous diet and might even be the most important factor in doing so. So I wanted to find out if fire type Pokemon, which generally have the highest body temperature, would also have a correlation between high body temperature and herbivory. If animals with high body temperatures are more likely to evolve into herbivores, would Pokemon follow a similar trend? So first I got a spreadsheet of all the Pokemon organized by type. And then I did real world research on modern tetrapods and real world fire types to find out what fire type Pokemon would eat. But first, let's start at the beginning. Modern tetrapods likely had a carnivorous ancestor probably somewhere between 300 and 400 million years ago. They have since evolved herbivory and omnivory multiple times in various different lineages. And there are even multiple times that something that evolved omnivory went back to carnivory or something that evolved herbivory reversing back to omnivory, which is what happened with singing mice from Latin America. Mammals evolved from a carnivorous ancestor and mice evolved into herbivores. Then singing mice had a diet reversal and evolved back into carnivores with their diets consisting mostly of insects. In Pokemon, this kind of diet reversal could have happened in Hippopotas and Whalemur. Now, this does assume that tetrapod Pokemon evolved, but in like a Darwinian natural selection way, in a similar fashion as animals. And we don't have genetics in the Pokemon universe yet, so let's assume that they did evolve this way for this example. A couple hundred million years ago, probably, we have the carnivorous tetrapod Pokemon ancestor that maybe looked something like this. Say hello to our first geek ecology Fakemon, Crawlagoon. Crawlagoon is a water ground type with abilities Mold Breaker and Own Tempo as well as Defiant. The fossil record suggests that Crawlagoon does not evolve to or from any other Pokemon, you know, besides like the actual natural selection evolution, and it is hypothesized to be the first fish-like Pokemon to venture on a dry land. It is a solitary Pokemon that would quietly lie in wait for prey to come near before launching out of the water to snag its victim. Its large armored head is useful for fighting off predators and also digging into the substrate of water bodies to hide itself. Its four legs, if you can even call them that, are basically just heavily modified fins, which seem extremely close to the lobe fins of Relicanth or the forelimbs of Dreepy, and they allow Crawlagoon to move through terrestrial environments to find new bodies of water. And this Pokemon is hypothesized to evolve into a wide variety of tetrapod Pokemon that we see today, with everything from Bulbasaur to Incineroar included. Pokemon that resemble amphibians, reptiles, or mammals. But let's zoom in on one herbivorous lineage of Pokemon that includes the ancestors of Hippopotas, Whalemur, Numel, Girafferig, Deerling, Tauros, and a few others to see how diet and evolution interact. With a few million years in between our oldest tetrapod Pokemon ancestor, Crawl Lagoon, and our oldest artiodactyl Pokemon ancestor, Alphoof, this normal type evolved into an herbivore that would later give rise to all these Pokemon. So let's meet our second geek ecology Pokemon, Alphoof. Alphoof is a small normal type Pokemon whose fossils have been found widely dispersed across the continent and in a variety of habitats. It has the abilities Adaptability and Protean, and will emit light out of the end of its tail to create a dazzling effect by bouncing off of its specialized colored spots in order to confuse predators. Alphoof is a friendly and social Pokemon, likely living in small family groups, and browses on low-lying vegetation. This is the earliest Pokemon to be found that has hooves, and is likely the start of the Artiodactyl Pokemon lineage. But somewhere between the beginning of the Artiodactyl-like Pokemon with Alphoof and its modern Pokemon ancestors that we see in the games, Hippopotas and Whalemur reverted back from herbivory to omnivory and carnivory respectively. And yeah, that's right, Hippopotas is confirmed to eat prey. Its Pokedex entry states that it moves through the sands with its mouth open, swallowing sand along with its prey. It gets rid of the sand by spouting it from its nose. Now the rest of this Pokemon is very herbivore coated with its stocky build and large flat teeth, and the fact that you have to feed an apple to Hippowdon to recruit it in Pokemon Super Mystery Dungeon instead of feeding it like a chicken wing or something, but it apparently has an omnivorous diet. I could see it swallowing up ground rock or bug types that typically also inhabit dry sandy desert habitats. 
and maybe it even functions as a terrestrial filter feeder, combing sands for some kind of tiny rock-type plankton, which is extremely similar to the other Pokémon in this clade that went through a diet reversal, which is Whalemur. This Pokémon is built exactly like modern baleen whales with its straining teeth for consuming plankton and krill, but it might also consume some fish-like Pokémon like Wishy Washy according to its Pokédex. It's pretty weird that two Pokémon that are related to a bunch of herbivores also evolved to live in aquatic or weird aquatic-like sand habitats, and evolve filter feeding, right? Like, what are the odds here? Oh, and did I mention that real-life hippopotamus and whales are actually each other's closest relatives? They both belong to the group Cetankodonta, so maybe Hippopotas and Whalemur are also closely related. Remember that Pokedex entry for Hippopotas I read earlier? It even expels excess sand through its nose. Now, this isn't exactly what a blowhole does for whales and whalemur. Instead, they just filter the water through their baleen in their mouths and exhale through the blowholes, which are also their nostrils. But it's suspicious that both of these Pokémon have evolved filter feeding and that their noses aid in their feeding strategies. These are two standout non-herbivores in the lineage mostly consisting of Pokémon that eat strictly plants, and I'm totally convinced that these two Pokémon are closely related and show the attention that Pokémon creators play to real-life biology and taxonomy. Like, maybe we even have a common ancestor to these two Pokémon that first evolved the filter feeding and blowhole noses. But wait, weren't we talking about fire types? Right, let's get back to that. So I entered in what I believe each fire type Pokémon would eat to see what percentage were herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. I then did the same to all of the normal types so that we would have something to compare it to. I figured that normal types would have the most normal distribution huh, of body temperatures since they are usually pretty generic or adaptable Pokémon. Then I filtered out all the Pokémon that weren't tetrapod-like Pokémon or weren't from Earth or our dimension and eliminated special forms. So no Megas, Legendary Space Aliens, or Ultra Beasts. For normal types, I ended up with 129 tetrapod Pokémon, of which 48 were herbivores, 46 were omnivores, and 35 were carnivores. Almost an even one-third split, but favoring herbivores a bit, with about 37% of the normal type tetrapods being herbivores. This is not what we would expect if tetrapod Pokémon evolved from a carnivorous ancestor. This paper suggests that diet across all animals is really conservative, even over long periods of time which means that groups of animals usually stick to their ancestral diet, and evolving a different diet is much more rare. If the ancestor to all of these Pokémon was carnivorous, we would expect most of these Pokémon to also be carnivorous. Our data might change if we look at the diet of every tetrapod Pokémon across all types, but for now I still have a day job and there's over a thousand Pokémon, so unless I catch Dialga and extort it for some time manipulation, I have to pass on that. Anyways, how does higher body temperature or the fire typing affect these changes and evolutions in diets? Of the 70 fire type tetrapod Pokémon, exactly half, so 35, I classified as omnivores, 24 were carnivores, and only 11 were herbivores, which equates to about 16%. So it doesn't appear that high body temperature is associated with herbivory, since less fire types are herbivores than their cooler body temperatured normal type relatives. In fact, it looks like it's the opposite. In real life, the reason that higher body temperatures were associated with the evolution of herbivory is due to the idea that the gut bacteria needed to break down cell walls and plants functions better at a higher body temperature. So non-herbivorous tetrapods that already had higher body temperatures are or were more likely to evolve herbivorous diets because their bodies might be able to support the right kind of bacteria. But just like every other living thing, gut bacteria also have an upper limit to their heat tolerance. Maybe the body temperatures of fire types are simply too high for most plant digesting bacteria to tolerate, which is why we see a low percentage of herbivorous fire types. So real tetrapods evolve from a carnivorous ancestor and high body temperature is associated with the evolution of herbivorous diets. But this does not seem to be the case in Pokémon, as normal types had a high degree of herbivory and fire types may just be too hot to digest plants effectively, as they had a low degree of herbivory. Because it probably is hard to eat grass if you're constantly spewing flames and lava straight out of your body. Let me know what you think of our first geek ecology fakemon, and if you find some of their fossils in your adventures, be sure to resurrect them so we can collect more data. And as always, thanks for watching.